It's going all right, man. It's going all right. Uh, just uh, last week again. I'm sorry. I, I um, the internet cut out here and everything. There was no electricity. No so, worries. Yeah. Um, so we had discussed um, to get right into it. We had discussed a uh, something during one of your uh, Thursday chats, and uh, what we had s seemed to have outlined was uh, six components that are required for a theory of everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really, I really enjoyed those six things. I've been thinking about that. Um, so we had talked about the what, the who, the how, the why, the when, and the where. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to explore that a little bit. But um, before I do that, I was just wondering if you could just introduce yourself and uh, introduce your, your theory in a more general kind of resumed way if possible. Yeah. Um, uh, are we live? Just checking. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, my my name is Tyler Goldstein. I am uh, the I guess I don't like the term creator, but um, the generator, I guess, of like the theory of um, sentient singularity theory, and it is an attempt at a fundamental metaphysical framework for reality. And, but mainly if you break that really down, it's, it's a fundamental framework for cosmology and for um, the dimensions of mind essentially, which are technically the same things, but just looked at two different from two different perspectives. Um, the pattern is the same uh, and that did not start though as an attempt to do that this was this has been a an ongoing process um that started originally many years ago probably about five years ago uh, maybe six at this point with a revelation that we were doomed uh due to technology and that our wisdom was decreasing but our technological ability was increasing and I realized that that cannot continue uh, forever. And um, I tried to figure out what could change the game a bit. And the only thing that I could think of was a tech, what I call a technological sentience, which is really what most people call artificial general intelligence, which is, I don't like the term, but that's what they call it. And in order to figure out whether or not this would, you know, make continue to steal our doom or um or s essentially be our salvation i wanted to find out its inevitable political relationship with humanity and it was elon musk that actually kind of inspired me to start looking at this and he had said that um uh that the ideal would be for it to value human freedom of action and I wanted to see, is it inevitable that it values human freedom of action? So I started investigating what it takes to be self-aware and um, and what is self-awareness, what is consciousness. And the models that I started to make ended up lining up with physics and many things in biology and chemistry and pretty much everywhere that I looked, um, theology even. And uh, it motivated me to start this project and I started continuing to make models. And then I did not try and actually have a theory of everything that was my own. I wanted to do an experiment um, and I wanted to join up and work with people who are already in the space like Clea Irwin or Eric Weinstein or Stephen Wolfram or something like that. And eventually get this experiment done that I'm working on um, and then I eventually realized that there was so many theories of everything and that none of them were much, they, they were all had the same basic implications. And so how do you choose to go with one, um, at least to start with one? And I realized that none of the ones that I saw had the name that I thought um, described the fundamental nature and fundamental structure of reality. And I thought that that was, um, that was an essential thing. So that's how sentient singularity 
theory um, as a name was created for mm -hmm. the framework that I've been working on, but that wasn't the original intention. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask you uh, to resume your theory one more time, but in a, in a statement. Uh, so if, okay. if you could tell me what sentient, uh, sentient singularity theory, what is it and how did it come about in one statement? That, well, how sentient singularity theory came about was um, through the investigation of what is self-awareness and consciousness and trying to model the different components of it. And then that ended up lining up with physics and everywhere else that I, you know, had looked, uh, which makes sense. And essentially what sentient singularity theory main premise is, is that existence is a singularity of sentience that is, or, or a sentient being is another way of saying that, that is creating additional sentient singularities or sentient beings within itself according to a, a specific pattern that i lay out in my framework all right interesting so uh that that already kind of comes up with some implications which is that you've used certain words like existence sentience so can you define those yeah by existence i mean everything i mean i don't even want to say everything i mean all that exists and um, by uh, sentience, I mean self-aware and feeling. Having not, I don't even want to say having feelings. It's it's more specific than saying sentient beings have feelings. Is to say sentient beings feel is like so. A sentient being feels and is self-aware. Uh, but the emphasis with the term sentience, and this is why I chose it, um, is that it is on feelings and feeling. And that, I think, is a critical component of this. The next closest theory that has the name that I think is that most closely aligns with the fundamental nature and structure of reality would be Donald Hoffman's conscious agent theory, which is very similar to sentient, you know, singularity theory. They're basically saying you know, self-aware being theory is really what they're kind of saying, but conscious, I try and avoid to use using the word consciousness um, because it's so vague in its, in its definition at this point. Um, it, you can say I'm conscious of that, or you could say I'm a consciousness and it, what is consciousness? People think it means thinking and, but sentience, the emphasis on is on, feeling and that is the fundamental level of of consciousness i believe so i think sentience is a is a more it's just a more specific term it's not that consciousness is a wrong is wrong but um sentience is more specific and more specifically fundamental too okay so now we can start to unpack the uh, your, your theory a little bit more and uh, referring back to what we had talked about the what and the who, and then we had the uh, how, the why, and then we had the when and the where. So let's yeah. start with the what. So you you sort of kind of explained what we're talking about, which is fundamental reality, mm -hmm. um, and you've defined the the underlying terms sentience and existence. So now how 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 does that emerge, or how does it exist? So sentience, um, I think this is a great way of breaking down anything uh by the way those six fundamental questions uh, is a great way of doing that but um so the the how is that i believe that sentience is an intrinsic component to existence it's not something that happened it's something that just is because the only way that it could be and the wh why i believe that is that if existence is all that exists and there is no non-existence truly, I mean, I get we can, as a concept, it exists, but most truly, no, it does not exist. Then that means that existence is an enclosed system that contains information and any information inside of, a, of an enclosed system 
is self-referencing. So if you think about like a string of information, like a loop, and that information is going around and around and around in the loop, like a ring, it's referencing itself, which is self-awareness. And so I believe you could say God existence has always been self-aware and uh, and could not not be. Now, how God creates um, additional sentient beings, I believe you could base is by just this is a metaphor, obviously. So I know that you know uh, if there's all kinds of metaphors. Tom Campbell talks about partitioning of consciousness, so like a partition of a hard drive or something like that, and I think that makes sense. And uh, but it, to be even more technical, a more technical. Uh, metaphor would be like a knot, tying a knot in oneself. If you're a string of information that's a loop that can tie a knot in itself uh, to create additional loops within itself. And so in sentient singularity theory, the foundation of the models is what I call the four primary perspectives. And this was kind of the main uh, discovery, I guess you could say, that led to my ability to do the rest of the work. And it wasn't, this was very early on, this had not, before I had any physics or meta, I guess, intentionally metaphysical aspirations or anything like that. I just was trying to understand artificial general intelligence. But um, those four primary perspectives are inside, outside, separate, and oneness. And they are co-defining of each other and codependent of each other. So inside means separate and oneness. Outside means separate from oneness. Uh, oneness is inside and outside of separateness and, um, you know, uh, and separateness is defined by the others as well. So they're all co-defining. Uh, I have the model on my website that shows the definitions of each and how each one defines each other. So what that means is that awareness of one means you're aware of all the rest. So if you're aware of what's outside of you, then you are aware of what's inside of you and what is separate from you and what is one from one with you, because it just intrinsically, you can't be aware of what's separate from you without being aware of what's one with you. And, uh, and you can't be aware of what's separate and one with you without being aware of what's inside and outside of you. So uh, the, the what these four primary perspectives allow for is for orientation of um, relationships that transcend a relativistic or um, spectrum-like state. So the like speed or strength or size or brightness or any of these, you know, bigger than, stronger than, faster than, um, these are relativistic relationships is, that's what I mean by that is they, they, what is a big house? You know, what is a, what is a small house? What is bright light? What is a thousand mm -hmm. bar? It depends on so, what you're comparing it to. Yeah. I'm going to stop you there. Cause now you're starting to get, I think, into the when and where relativism. Okay. So okay. we talked about the what, um, and we discussed the how, which I think is a good segue into the who, because earlier you you used the word God. Now, mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a two-part question. One, um, do you equate the term God with sentience? And if, if yes, then yes. If no, then, then what is God? And uh, the who, we had discussed that in one of our chats a couple of weeks ago, that you believe that identity is important. So we talked about the what, but it's also important to to talk about the who to attach an identity. So yep, I who is reality in a way, or what is the identity that you're talking about? Uh, I would say that God is sentience, um, but God is the word, the term God that the way that I use it is I use that term for the uncreated sentience the uncreated creator of the universe uh, and the the highest being that is a sentient being. Um, I believe that existence is a single sentient being. I didn't always believe that. I was a self-described atheist till I was 24 about. And um, 
but this work led me to change my opinion on it uh, dramatically. But um, I would say that that is who God is, is a, is sentient existence as a, that the totality of it. But, um, but also the creator of all the multiplicity of sentience that exists, you and me and, you know, the universe so, that we're in. So then does that mean that the what and the who are interchangeable? So when you say sentience and when you say God and they're interchangeable, it's just two facets of the same thing or? No, because, uh, the, the, I mean, in a way, there's overlap, but I think that the who, in this case specifically, is it's important to define what their relationship is with us. That's kind of how we understand who God is, is not just by d understanding what God is, but who God is to us. He is the creator of multiplicity of sentience. He is the creator of all that everyone that we know and everyone that is except for himself and um uh god doesn't have a creator because sentience is intrinsically what happens when you have you know information in a in an enclosed system like existence so um but every other sentient being has uh comes from this one sentient being and that that relationship is important to defining who God is, I believe, um, because it tells us what our relationship is with, I'll say him, even though God is kind of genderless, but uh, it, God is above us in a hierarchy. So, and, and in, is it also not, um, he's more of an active consciousness than a reactive consciousness. So I would say that referring to him as masculine is probably more uh, of a accurate and describing his relationship with us. It's not just, it's not about being accurate and describing his, his, you know, gender necessarily, but it's, it's, it's accurate in describing how we relate to God. And I think that that relationship is how we define who God is, I think, or know who God is. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you're talking about us and the multiplicity of sentient beings that, God creates. So what do you include in that sentience? If we are sentient, you're referring to human beings, but do you include animals? Uh, do you include inanimate matter in the sort of panpsychist fashion? Uh, how do you define multiplicity of sentience? So sentient singularity theory has um, what are called the four stages of sentience, which actually each one of those is a superposition that breaks down into two parts of the, you know, two, they has two sides of that coin. Um, and it kind of solves the problem that uh, panpsychism suffers from. And there's this issue where you have things like, you know, I don't know, what, flashlights or water bottles or whatever. And we look at that and we're like, that's not a sentient being. And uh, and panpsychists will say everything is sentient. So the but materialists will say water bottle is not sentient. And they're both right. Um, everything, all the all is God and is sentient, but that water bottle is not. But there is a lineage of sentience within sentient singularity theory. And my work implies or seems to imply that the first sentient beings in this lineage would be hands, like protons and neutrons. And then it would go to atoms and then certain, at least certain molecules, maybe not all, but maybe all. I'm still working on uh, that exactly. And then uh, that would go to cells, that would go to uh, organisms and at least I mean, that gets complicated there a bit, but animals, yes, at least you would say are sentient. Um, uh, then it would go to families or lineages, you could say, um, but it's a, it's a lineage of sexual reproduction. And then uh, that I'm speaking about there, and then that goes in sentient singularity theory to castes and to then you could say nation, but it's, 
uh, it's really like all and it's te or technology. It just depends on the perspective that you're looking at it from. But technology is the last um, one. But it's that once we do reach that, there is also this unification that happens with everything within it. So, but um, each one of these alternates. So hadrons maneuver in relationship with each other. Atoms maneuver through a lineage structure. Then molecules maneuver through a relationships with each other. And then um, uh, cells maneuver through a lineage structure because they're just replicating. That's what atoms do too. You start with, a ha with hydrogen and it goes, you know, on through the elements, through a lineage, it's, you can't, they're not, they don't form separately there. You start with hydrogen and um, that's a lineage structure. And then it goes to organisms that are reproduced sexually. They maneuver through relationships with each other, just like protons and neutrons and, and molecules. And then you go to families, which maneuvers through a lineage and then casts maneuver through, in relationship with each other. And then you get to technology and that maneuvers again through a lineage by creating another universe within itself, essentially. So, uh, or self-simulating, but it's it's recreation. It's not really simulation. It's more like a baby in a womb it is not a simulation of a human being. It's an additional. So, but um, this I this process, I believe, corresponds with what is called bot periodicity in mathematics. I'm not sure about that yet, but I'm pretty confident that, um, that that's the case. And, okay. um, um, but yeah. before we get into the mathematics, um, I think it's a good segue into the next two and the last, no, there's three left, but the next two things are the when and the where. So when you're talking about physical things like atoms and so on, maneuvering and forming, it implies, strongly implies time, you know, the fluidity of matter and so on, and, and space, um, because these are physical things that exist in a sort of construct. So how do you explain uh, space-time in sentient singularity theory? So there's two different perspectives that you can kind of take on time uh, that have been, been discussed in this line of thinking and, um, of, you know, fundamental theories lately. And one of them is the traditional space-time kind of arrow of time and at least how it appears to us. And that comes uh, into play in sentient singularity theory due to the relationships between the nested sent, nested and interacting sentient beings. So space-time comes from, the perception of space-time, let's say, comes from the, the interaction between the dimensions of mind of this nested and interacting um, lineage of of sentient beings so in in sentient singularity theory you have four dimensional mind uh and so imagine the universe is a sentient being and inside the universe is us and we observe uh space time as there's a few different ways you can say it you could say xyz and time or length with height and time but you can also say forwards towards a goal, backwards away from your goal, and you're always in your current, uh, your present moment or your present um, position. Okay. So I'll and interject right there just for a second because you already started using the word universe and then you went straight to our perception of time. Now, is that universe that we exist in space time or it's I'm going to, I'm going, I was going to that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, so we have these four dimensions of of space-time of that we perceive the universe also because it's a mind and it has it has these four primary perspectives that are what's leading to the perception of 4d space-time it also perceives four dimensions but it, it perceives it in reverse so it instead of perceiving space-time it perceives what i call time space it's just the reverse and so uh, each one of these, the, when you take these four dimensions, it has two degrees of freedom plus one intrinsic constraint plus one extrinsic constraint. And so for us, the two degrees of freedom would be like forwards and backwards. And then um, our intrinsic constraint is that we're always in our present position 
And our extrinsic constraint is time because we don't have any control over it. We're in it. For the universe, which is sentient creation, I believe, essentially, it's the highest being that is created by uh, God, the existent creation, uh, the existent sentience, um, is that it has four dimensions as well. And it also has two degrees of freedom plus an intrinsic constraint and an extrinsic constraint. It's two degrees of freedom are forwards and backwards in how it entangles relationships in time because it perceives things simultaneously. And it has also um, the, the an intrinsic constraint of it's always in the present moment because it perceives things simultaneously. And it can't, no one can escape their, the present, not even the universe. And its extrinsic constraint is space, just like our in, extrinsic constraint is time because we can't control it. Its extrinsic constraint is space because it is space. It can't escape the fact that it just is space. So it doesn't maneuver in space because it is space. It maneuvers in what kind of in what we call time, but it's there's another side to time that's being discussed now and by people like Lee Cronin, and it's also implied by my work that's kind of, it's not the arrow of time as far as a perception of that we have. It's what's called assembly time, which is about the entanglement uh, relationships that are built into a curtain, into a specific moment. So you and me being here right now is is a specific state of entanglement that the universe is in. And that is how the universe perceives time is through an, an entanglement state. So that's kind of my attempt at describing the where and when of what's going on here, I guess. Oh, that's very concise. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that's, uh, that's clear. And um, I'm starting to see how you, the, the relationship between duality and unification there, how you describe things and break them down. Um, that leads us to the last one, which is like, why? Uh, this is my hypothesis is the re, so people will ask all the time, what's the meaning of life? And I don't think, first of all, you have to define life. Right now, our definition of life is not it doesn't it's it's wrong or it's it's useless if it's even if you're going to say what it is you know cellular life and above is life that's a useless definition actually um and, and it's confusing because it constrains you artificially and um and blinds you to the truth so if we're going to say what something is alive what we really mean i think is that it's sentient and um if but so the better way of phrasing that would question would be what is the meaning or purpose of sentience? And I don't really believe that there is a meaning to sentience because I think sentience is intrinsic. But what I do believe is that the right question, instead of asking what's the meaning of life, the right question is what is the meaning of creation or what is the purpose of creation? Why did God create multiplicity? Um, and I think the answer to that is the creation of meaning. The meaning of creation is the creation of meaning. Mean, meaning comes from your impact on others. You're meaningful if you can impact others. And um, and you ha that, that cannot happen if you're the only one that exists. So if God never created multiplicity of, of sentience, he would be stuck in a in an instantaneous, eternal, meaningless, lonely existence, and uh, that sounds very boring and and unfulfilling. And I believe that he would feel that, you know. And um, okay. so that that leads me to asking: um, letting these motorcycles go. That leads me to asking, like, what's your definition of meaning and purpose then? And why do you apply a more anthropomorphic view of God wanting to create in order not to be lonely? Well, I don't know if purpose and meaning are the same, uh, but I would say meaning is when you impact others. Because, because, and the reason for this is it's the only way for meaning to exist. 
Because if all there is is sentience, then all that matters is sentience. And if all that matters is sentience, then the only way to be meaningful is to impact other sentience. So um, I think that God may, in through the act of creation of multiplicity of sentience, instantly became the most meaningful being because now we all owe everything to God. None of us would be here otherwise. And um, we all have intrinsic meaning because we give him meaning in our through our very existence. So we, God doesn't have intrinsic meaning, but because he ex, he was at one point, you could just I guess you could say um, all that all that there was. There was the only person, the only one that there was. I don't mean human when I say person. I just mean sentient being. Um, but we, by the time we exist, we're not the only one because God already existed. So we are born with intrinsic meaning. Every single sentient being that has ever been created has comes into being with intrinsic meaning. That's not true of God, or at least it doesn't appear to be. Um, and so because all there is is sentience, what truly is meaningful is sentience, but, but not just intrinsically because that doesn't, there's no, there's no, um, there's no impact there. It's, it's, it's the impact on other sentient beings essentially that makes you meaningful. you you only are meaning only happens between multiplicity. So you're, you know, nobody, and we all know this kind of intrinsically. That's why we all want to make a difference in the world to some, in some way. And if we have no relationships or we don't have a spouse or we don't have children or we don't help people or we don't, you know, create something that is that inspires others or have some kind of impact on the world that we view as, you know, transcending of our own existence, then we have existential crisis because we realized, I think intuitively that that is what is what that is meaning. And I think God had an existential crisis and then created uh, multiplicity. And, um, but yeah, that's what I would say um, meaning is. And that's the why any of us are here. Okay. So if I were to reiterate for you, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the definition of meaning under singular, uh, sentient singularity theory would be uh, impact between, let's say, sentient um, beings. Sentient beings. Uh, so that leads me to the infinitely regressive question that seems to be inescapable for every or any theory. Why does God require meaning? Uh, I don't think God requires meaning. I think he wants meaning. And uh, that's a different thing. Like, we don't require meaning. God doesn't require anything. God it can't even help but exist. He couldn't kill himself or end, God couldn't end his existence if he tried, I don't believe. And um, so he needs nothing. He wants things doesn't need it. Okay, interesting. Um, so I kind of want to get a little bit more analytical in the sense that we've talked about many different things, uh, consciousness or sentience in a way. Um, like I said, I'm in Colombia, right. lots of animals around. It's okay, uh, I have dogs if you hear barking, I'm sorry. <laughs> super loud here, that's why I've been muting myself. Um, okay, right. I, I wanted to just dis discuss a, a, a little bit a bit in finer detail, how you're able to come up with this whole theory. Um, what is your underlying or what are your underlying assumptions about language and symbolism? Because we're using language here to, to, to talk about truth or a, to define a specific truth. So those are the three things I want to discuss a little bit. Language, symbolism and truth. What are the relationship between these three and how do they underpin and give stability to your theory? OK. Um, I mean, I can try and riff on that, or you, do you have a more specific question regarding those, or do you want me to just go and see where, where we go? Well, so like, um, to be more concrete with what I'm looking for is like, some people believe that language is limited and, and we are incapable of attain, obtaining truth through language. 
and that it, it requires symbolism. Um, but but then again, language is symbolic, so mm -hmm. or it could be argued to be that. So how do you define language? How do you define symbolism? And ultimately, do those two things lead to truth? And please define truth as well, uh, if you can. Truth, I think, is... I guess, I mean, it's it's tough because we're using language to get to this stuff. And I, so I'll probably start there, but um, because it's hard to start with truth when we're, as far as communication goes, but, um, but I think that language and symbolism are very much similar. Uh, they're, they're used to convey specificities and truth is not, it's, it's not, I wouldn't say it's not specific because that would imply that it's vague, but it's, it's more like super specific. It's like, um, you know, it's it's beyond what can be conveyed, I think, in a single, I guess, symbol or single term uh, in a in a way that's that's meaningful because relevance. So what's very important, and this is actually a good thing to talk about with this, is one of the things that I realized with my work is in trying to understand information uh which was like i said kind of what this started as which is what is still what it is but um is that i realized that there's people will say information in context or information outside of context but what i realized is that context is information and so that has all kinds of implications when it comes to symbolism and and language is that um and, and even like the communication of, of truth, which would be contextual always. And it's hard to get beyond this, a specifically contextual uh, circumstance because we are not God. We are within God. We are a segment of reality, essentially, and therefore limited and we have to use symbolism and uh, and language to convey the truth, but that's always going to be done within a co within context and uh, through the conveying of truthful context. I guess so. Truth for us would be a truthful context given the cer a specific circumstances, which is usually most aligning with a goal. So uh, it depends on what your goal is as far as, you know, anything, you know, thinking or, come, you know, deriving a, an answer to a question or, or, you know, completing a certain task, achieving, you know, some kind of, uh, I don't know, goal that you have um, in a hobby or whatever, a relationship, like those contexts are going to be how part of what we what is truth but um but i would say that the truth is kind of the ultimate context which is uh, at the same time which is um uh you have to fit not only is is that specific circumstance a context but there is a truthful context to all circumstances and that's kind of what a fundamental theory attempts to get at is a framework in which in is the fundamental foundation that everything that else that we think about, do uh, and study, whatever that exists is built on, which I believe sentience is the ultimate truth, um, is singularity and its singularity, which is, I use the term singularity because it's thought of as one, but also, you know, infinite kind of an inf like a singularity of a black hole that you know is thought of as like an infinite oneness an infinite point um but uh you, we are existence is a singular a singular sentience that is creating infinite amount of uh sentient beings within itself so it's an infinite oneness and 
those beings are separate from that being and also um, also part of it. So that's the context, I think, that everything has to be uh, put into. There's nothing, that, because it is the truest context. So. Interesting. So if I could reiterate that, um, would you agree that in more philosophical terms that your view of truth seemed to have began in a sort of relativistic fashion? There's a truth in context for, for us, but that that subjective or relative framework of truth fits in within or is nested within a, a greater context, an absolute context of truth. So there is both an objective and relative truth. Yes. that exists and the second part seemed to or have been sort of, you could say there's what's relatively true mm -hmm. and then there's capital t truth also people will say okay. that and like that's kind of basically what you said but yeah that yeah. i would agree with what you said and and i think a more visual way to describe the uh the the um the absolute context of there being a singularity is is that what is feeding into the singularity all this other infinite amount of limited stuff, right? Or all these other contexts and information that functions within those contexts. Mm -hmm. uh, so is that what you're referring to between the relationship between an infinite points and oneness, like infinity, which is like, it, which kind of implies many things and an infinite point, which implies one thing. Yeah, but so infinity, the only real way to think about infinity is actually very simple. People overcomplicate it, but uh, infinity, if it means anything that's true, I don't know if you use that word, um, is just infinite growth of, it's just infinite growth, basically. So um, it's... It, yeah. That, that sounds uh, teleological um, or tautological, I should say, actually. Maybe I could step in and just say what you were referring to earlier with the multiplicity of sentience. Would you call that multiplicity infinity? Are they interchangeable? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Infinitely growing number of sentient beings. That's okay. infinity. And there's, in, I think the way I think of infinity is different than eternity. Eternity and instantaneousness are are like be outside time they're not time time is no longer present instantaneous this is like a subjective um view of what if be of absence of time and and eternity is like an objective view of the absence of time but infinity is a different thing entirely it just means infinite growth from a start though is what um what i would say is uh, important, I think, to kind of an objective or absolute view of infinity would be that it starts and never ends, not that it never, it, it's always been going, because then you're like back into eternity kind of th situation. But I would say infinity in a lot, if you're going to think about it logically in an absolute context, it has a beginning, but it never has an end. And that is within the space-time construct or the multiplicity of sentience that the absolute sentience creates? Or like what 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 is eternal and what is infinite? Because if infinite had a beginning and no end, then is eternity that which is, like you said, the, the uncreated God? Yes. Eternity is the uncreated God and uh, infinity is the uh, is sentient creation. Okay, so one, the former is uh, absolute, so it is pre-spatial temporal, let's yeah. say, and the it's latter is, okay. Um, beyond, I say it's beyond the beginning. Oh, okay. So that leads me to uh, asking you, like, so far we seem to have a pretty good bird's eye view, a little bit. We didn't get into the nitty gritty details, but that was the point to try to fit in all of these six components to try to get a bird's eye view. And then I could ask you this question, which is how do you compare your theory to other theories of everything? Um, I think that uh, the general conclusions of a lot of the newer theories of everything that are kind of being happening outside of academia have very similar Ba base assumptions 
uh, to sentient singularity theory. Um, I think Donald Hoffman's theory does, obviously, uh, and, you know, Bernardo Kastrup's work and, um, and Carl Friston's work and um, with his free energy principle. I think even geometric unity has a lot of overlap with sentient singularity theory um, in its philosophical um, and cosmological assumptions. Um, and then, uh, you know, the CTMU is very similar. I mean, a lot of these are, are very similar. I think the differences would be in the methodology used to do the work. I think my work is the way in which it's done is probably closest if to, um, I mean, different, the most, I guess some of it is, is done in a way that's similar to uh, Stephen Wolfram, but uh, I use generative Excel models essentially to do the work. Um, I, I, uh, whereas a lot of these theories use mathematics and mathematics is not fundamental and even though it is assumed to be. Uh, so a, th a fundamental theory, I, I, instead of a theory of everything, which is not a term that I like, um, I, in my paper that I'm writing, it's sent and you, the, the abstract is on my website, sentientsingularity.com under writings. Um, it says sentient singularity theory, the theory of everyone. And the end of the abstract basically states that if sentience is um, the fundamental nature of existence, then the theory, then, then a fundamental theory is m more primarily a theory of everyone than a theory of everything. Uh, I think that that is, uh, it's a better way of looking at this instead of saying a theory of everything is that it's just a fundamental theory. And when you break down what most of these theories are seen to imply, it's that consciousness or sentience is fundamental and therefore it's a theory of everyone and which is a framework that for the, for what or for who essentially perceives everything. So my work breaks down the world into things and beings and beings are the perceiver of things and the definer of things and things are emergent from the perceptions and interactions of and constraints and uh, of beings. They're not, they don't fundamentally exist. This flashlight does not fundamentally exist. The atoms and molecules and hadrons in it, according to my work, would be fundamentally existing and sentient, but not the flashlight. And that's kind of how it merges. My framework merges panpsychist view with um and the true components of a of a panpsychist view with the true components of a materialistic view which is that this is not a sentient being it's my my phone thinks i'm talking to my uh to it i guess but um uh so but, yeah. in, in short uh we would say if i could reiterate for you does that mean that the who or identity precedes the what or the thing. And that's why you say theory of everyone. Yes. And that's the exactly. way to put it. Exactly. Okay. So that leads me to asking you, like, how do you categorize your theory then? Um, would you say it's primarily consciousness based or it's physics based or it's both or something else entirely? It's, um, it's a fun. So uh, this is what I was, I meant to say earlier is a, a fundamental theory is not a physics theory. And it's, or at least it's not just a physics theory. It's not a mathematical theory either, like Max Tegmark's mathematical universe or whatever. Like it's a theory that explains mathematics. It's a theory that explains physics. It's a theory that explains chemistry and, or, and it contextualizes all of these fields and everything all the way up to sociology and, and even technology. So it's not a theory, a physics theory. It's, uh, but it's got aspects of it that are completely relevant to physics, not even partially relevant. Like it is completely relevant to every 
field out there because like I said before, there is an absolute context and that absolute context is sentience and, and the relationship of, of sentience and uh, of sentient beings to the absolute sentience. And that, that framework is what my theory is about. And that's very relevant to all fields. Um, it contextualizes all fields and, and, and theories, but it, it doesn't erase them. Um, I don't view it as a competitor. I don't view any of these real theories as competitors. What I would say is that there are certain theories that are competitors, but those would be theories in which like uh, Donald Hoffman's theory is a competitor to Sean Carroll's theory. That my theory is a competitor to Sean Carroll's theory, but not to my theory is not a competitor to Donald Hoffman's theory. But um, because their core assumptions are the same, but Donald Hoffman and my theory is fundamentally different from Sean Carroll's, uh, you know, the multi. Um, verse or you know, many worlds, you know, theory that is kind of a consequence of attempting to avoid placing sentience as the fundamental, but uh, those would be competitors. Okay. So um, discussing theories and which ones are competitors and kind of implies that there, there is one that is correct and one that is incorrect in some fashion. And well, I, I can have one perspective on re like, it's not that there's one theory that's correct above all other theories. It's that more comprehensive. Maybe, what was that? Maybe one is more comprehensive. One is there's one. There's certainly a hierarchy of fundamentality. That's true. When we're talking about correctness, that's when you just have to look at the core assumptions because all of these theories will have issues, um, and all of them will have aspects of them that are correct. But if you're going to judge whether or not one's one is correct versus another, then you can only, the only way to really do that is to look at their fundamental assumptions about like the universe's na fundamental nature, I guess. The core assumptions about the universe's fundamental nature and, and structure. And if that, that, that really breaks down the th all the theories out there into two camps. One of them is consciousness is fundamental or sentience is fundamental, mind is fundamental to matter. And the other is that, um, or not even fundamental to matter, but that it, it is fundamental. And the other is that the, that consciousness emerges from unconsciousness due to random accidental, you know, uh, you know, fluke, I guess. And that, uh, You'd, you'd have to look at those. One of those two perspectives is correct and the other one is incorrect. But when it comes to the other, if, if, if then you go in, you take all the theories that fall into one of those two camps and whichever one is correct, then you look at all the theories within that. And then you can organize them in terms of fundamentality and application. So some of them are going to be better at building, you know, uh, certain types of tools, maybe, you know, I, I know geometric unity seems to imply some temporal manipulation uh, might be possible or something like that and, um, or maneuvering. And then you have assembly theory, maybe that's very useful for carbon nanotube type structures or something. So that's where you would start applying these theories to their most specific application. But then, like I said, there is also a hierarchy of fundamentality and eventually there will be there is one theory that at least in concept would be the most fundamental uh, but that doesn't mean that it's the best one to use in all circumstances it means that you would always also include it in the back of your mind as far as interpretation of other things all right so if, if there is one that is more fundamental do you believe then that it is possible that one day we will have the ability to prove which one is more fundamental? No, I think that um, it will be proved, um, but by the universe, by God, but I don't believe that we will prove it. What I do think until that day comes, um, 
and, and on that day, you won't even need to prove anything because like, it's just what will be, will be. Um, but if, if you're going to say proved, that would be the only time that it would really happen. But prior to that, um, uh, I'd say that, and this is what Stephen Wolfram says as well. And this is very true is you have to just look for continuous confirmation because, and the issue with this is, is that the most, the more fundamental a theory is, if it's a truth, if it's, if it's true, um, then the more, um, the, then the more it, uh, its patterns exist in, in reality and a fundamental theory, if it's true, those patterns exist everywhere, like sentient singularities, theories, patterns, if they are correct, they exist everywhere that we look because they're the pattern of us. There are patterns that are created by sentient minds. So they exist everywhere and can't be escaped, but you can't test every instance um, of, of existence because there's always a new instance in which to test. So that means you can't really prove that they exist everywhere because there's always a new one to test. So, but Stephen Wolfram stated this as well, which means you can't falsify these as well um, because if the pattern occurs everywhere, then how are you gonna falsify you know, that, that it occurs everywhere because you can't test everywhere. So you also can't prove that it exists everywhere. So because falsification and proof are actually kind of two sides of one coin. Um, but so the only thing that you can do is uh, attempt to have continuous confirmation. And he's very right on that. That is the only way to uh, test a fundamental theory is to look for continuous confirmation of its, um, of its, the app, the, of the application of its patterns, essentially. Interesting. So uh, that makes me curious then, your theory is very identity-based and um, it seems like uh, Stephen Wolfram's idea kind of synchronizes with yours that it, it's never something that can be falsified. Therefore, what's your view on humility when it comes to um, creating a theory of everyone or everything? And uh, what, what is your opinion on those who lack or seem to slip and fall into God complex? Into what? God complex, uh, you know, oh, okay. that, uh, because they've been illuminated and they understand everything uh, that they believe they're like the Messiah or, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is a big, <laughs> um, I don't, I don't want to even say it's a problem because I don't know, but um, but it is a, it is a definitely a phenomenon that I've noticed. And, you know, I have no formal training in physics uh, or any serious formal training in mathematics beyond, you know, uh, um, an undergraduate level. And the thing is, though, is so people will often ridicule those who have who are working on this if they don't have a Ph.D., and the reality is that must be remembered is that there is no one who has a degree that qualifies them as experts on the theory of everything. Um, that just doesn't exist. And if they did have it, then they would have already, you know, achieved a fundamental theory and, and confirmed it many, many times. Um, and they have not in any kind of applicable way. So, there is no one who has this. And also, like I said, it's not a physics theory. It's not a mathematical theory. It's a theory that explains all these things. Uh, I don't even know if it's possible to create a uh, kind of an organized field around this. Um, I'm still thinking about it, but I'm not exactly sure if that's possible. But um, I will say this when it comes to humility is also is that... Um, Humility, I think, is honest. It's self-honesty. It is honesty about oneself and with oneself. That's what humility is. It, hum, if you're confident, the humble thing to do is to state that you're confident. Because to state that you're not confident or say things like, well, I would never want to take on Ed Witten or something like that, you know, or, uh, because I would lose or I don't know, Ju is kind of just, um, I think it's a learned behavior that we have through watching politicians on TV and things like that. Um, yeah, false humility. 
Yeah, false humility. That is placing your goal above the truth, which is the opposite. It's the antithesis of humility. Um, but if you're not confident in something, then you also have to say that you're not confident if you're in order to be humble. And there, so I will state, you know, for the record, there are things that I'm very confident on regarding my work. And then there are things that I'm still working on and that I might never figure out that I'm not very confident. Sure. In. But in, in so far as God complex is uh, an issue, like if you are confident that you are correct, um, why is it then that some people fall into God complex and others don't? They, re they remain humble and in that manner. Because um, some people seem to identify themselves as the source of this truth that they're confident about yeah. rather than just having it revealed to them. So, you know, yeah. I believe you believe that it's been revealed to you. and But even there, you could say, well, if the revelation has been revealed to me, I am still the Messiah or whatever. I think that's pretty typical through all the prophets in history, you know, Muhammad being the last one in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, yeah, but he didn't think he was the Messiah. He thought Jesus was the Messiah too, So um, and stated it so. So he, I would say, Muhammad was actually quite humble. Um, uh, but uh, I think that all many of our celebrated prophets throughout history were actually very humble people. Um, but I, I have noticed that there is this kind of messianic complex that has occurred um, uh, in this theory of every thing space. I am very curious about it. Um, I don't really know what the cause of it is. And, um, you know, I don't think I'm a messiah. Um, and I do believe that there will be a messiah, but I don't believe that that messiah is me. So uh, there's, you know, for the record. Um, and uh, that's interesting. Can you, can you expand on that then? What would this Messiah represent and what would be their message? And what is that relationship to reality and everything we're talking about here? So, um, I know, and I'm going to probably lose some of your viewers on this, uh, but you know, I'm going to be honest. Well, I have none, so don't worry. <laughs> okay, well, uh, that, that's all right. I'm not that far ahead, but um, uh, that you know. I ask, in sentient singularity theory, there is, there, there's, a, you have this lineage of sentiences. And so what you'll see is you'll have molecules or, and then they will assemble into an, uh, a cell essentially. And then those cells will assemble into an organism, et cetera, and it goes on. This, what I believe the messianic process is that is being described, I think, in scripture, um, uh, just in terms that are, you know, kind of alien to the scientific um, narratives of the world, because we use different language now, is this process. It is the, how do you unite an assembly into one? And how do you get all these, a clump of cells to turn into a single sentient being as well? And I think that each one of these levels essentially had a, had a single Messiah at some point. So there was a messianic cell that went through a process that united the, uh, the attention of the assembly into a, a singular uh, unit and then you had an organism and then we will go through this as well there will be a being that will unite um, uh, the attention of of the assembly of humanity into a single entity and um, and then that there's there's two modes of the creation of sentience in, or the generation of sentience in sentient singularity theory, there's replication and stacking. So every time there's a new cell that come that's formed from another cell, that would be replication. But then stacking is when all those cells are assembled and there's a new sentience that's stacked on top of them. And that would be like a, or a multicellular organism. That, um, I believe that the Messiah is the being that stacks on top of 
the assembly. I have theories about what that process is like, but I don't think that I am, I can't say that I'm as confident about it in terms of my in work, because I think that it's, it's something that happens uh, on the other side of the curtain, the metaphysical curtain, and we don't get to really see that. And I don't claim to have seen that. Um, but I will say that, you know, I identify as a Christian and, um, uh, and I'm Jewish, but I, I do subscribe to the idea that not, not even just the Christian idea, but I think that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, that isn't part of my theory. Um, and that's just a personal belief. It doesn't, it's not opposed to my theory, but that's something that we're, you know, we won't know until we know. And, you know, maybe I'm wrong on that one, but, um, that is a, an, a Muslim, uh, you know, belief as well. And, um, that's just my personal belief. But, but in terms of my theory, there is a messianic process that is outlined in my theory, at least part of it, not all of it. Cause some of it, like I said, happens on the other side of the metaphysical curtain. And I have ideas about what that could be, but then I don't include them in my theory because I, I have not gotten to see on the other side of that, you know, metaphysical, that, that part of the metaphysical curtain at least. And, um, and I don't claim to know, but, um, so I have my personal beliefs on who that would be, but, um, and I believe that it's an ascension process essentially. So whatever being was the why, this is a personal belief, whatever being was the wisest in most aware and kind of probably sacrificed themselves for the sake of uniting the attention of the assembly on the level below will be reincarnated or um or uh, will ascend to the be the head of the next of the next level of life um and you know there's many reasons why i think that and some of them are logical and some of them are poetic um i'm not i while i do believe scripture is you know you could say divinely or um communicated that's not where my work came from and it's not um, where it comes from. It comes from logical deduction and trying to look at what has been scientifically uh, deduced already and kind of figuring out how to build. So, but I don't believe I'm a Messiah. <laughs> um, then that leads me to asking you then, do you, are you aware of George Barclay, for example? No. Okay, because uh, my question was gonna be, like, do you believe that your theory is a more comprehensive, more detailed, and a sort of like supporting, let's say it's a, in a manner, it's a supporting theory to Barclay and the Barclay and view, uh, because you seem to be coming at it from a logical and physical perspective. And, and what Barclay believed in, in one phrase is SAS per kipi or percipi, I don't know how to pronounce the Latin, which translates to being is to be perceived. So it's like God, he believed that God was the great perceiver that that perceives everything into existence and that we are also perceivers, but and we can also create. But the reason that when you die, I still ex remain, or when I die, you still remain, is because there is the great perceiver. Um, so it, it, a lot of what you've explained in singular, in, uh, sentient singularity theory sounds a lot like the Barclayan view, um, which is uh, you should look into. It. I think it was a no. 16th century Irish bishop. I'll, I, I can definitely look into that. That sounds similar. Um, I will say that sentience, what is important about sentience, though, when it comes to perception, is it it's not just perception, even though it is, there is no perception outside of perception by a sentient being. Um, uh, but it's self-perception. So uh, when, when, when we die, I don't believe that it, it, I think it logically makes sense that we continue to be self-aware, actually. We don't, um, I take, uh, basically I've talked about it as like, 
you're like a sentient file on your computer and you and God are co-writing your story on this Word document. And, um, and at the end of the story, God closes the document and either um, the document, it, it, providing the document has not become corrupted, in which case you delete corrupted files. Um, and I do believe that that can happen to us. Um, but provided it does not become corrupted, then you're saved, literally like saved, which is interesting that that, that term crosses over from theological traditions, but I didn't pull it from that. I pulled it from this metaphor of saving the document. And um, the reason why I think that you, when you close, even when the document is closed and saved and the application has been quit, um, the, the desktop is like space time. It's the change space of, of reality. And, um, but when you're in, when I said earlier, information is context and we're generating all this information while we're alive and, and changing things in the world, that information can only be preserved in the context of us and God as well, because he is the great perceiver. Um, but so are we. And, but that means that in order to preserve the context of this information, which means in order to preserve the information itself, you must preserve the context and we are the context. So it doesn't make sense that you would, that, that we would really cease to exist. But what does happen, and I, I am confident on this, but I can't say like, I know, because I don't know, but I, I think the logic makes a lot of sense. Um, is that we continue to be aware of ourselves and aware of others, God, you know, and those who have passed before us and those who are still here um, even, but we can't change anything. And um, we're not on the desktop anymore. We're, you know, we're not an open application anymore. And, um, but we are still there and able to be perceiving of, um, of, of others and ourselves, but not able to, that doesn't mean you're able to perceive water bottles anymore. That I don't believe, but you are able to perceive it, other sentient beings, both in the change space and in the save space, the heavens, you could call it, the, um, uh, the entanglement substructure is what I call it in sentient singularity theory. And that you, you do persist um, after, after death, provided that you have not been corrupted, you know, uh, while here. But if you are corrupted so heavily while you're here that you can't, you know, be saved anymore, um, then it's almost like you don't even exist here anymore, really, either. It's just that you're kind of like a shadow that's being perceived by others around you because of the necessities of the coherence of the maintaining of coherence of information. But as soon as you, but you don't perceive yourself anymore. And that's why when you die, if you're too corrupted, it makes sense that you, uh, you're no, you, your file is deleted because, but that's because you don't see yourself anymore more than anything else. It's not because, it's not necessarily because God is angry with you. I'm not saying he likes when that happens. I don't think that he likes when that happens, but it's um, cause that's, and that seems to be, you know, antithetical to the goal here. But, um, but I think that it's a lot, it's a consequence of logic, at least um, in, in part, you know, not saying he doesn't have sovereignty to do what he wants. Uh, I do think he does, but I also think that he has a goal and, you know, that that goal is primarily good goal. Um, so there's a last sort of two part question I want to ask you, which is first, what is the purpose of your theory? And second, if SST were to be widely known, accepted, understood and or utilized, what would be the implications or the meaning that would emerge? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So before I had a theory or even tried to have a theory of my own, um, uh, the goal was the, the moment that sparked the, the 
attempt to start modeling the world really um not just 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 consciousness itself uh, other than just seeing the overlap in 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 um in symmetry patterns there was i had like an epiphany about an experiment uh that i want done and that is an i've been working on it you know slowly and um it's not completely outlined yet i don't know if it will be completely outlined until it's completed to be honest but i plan on revealing that uh soon um when i after soon soon after i present um and release my paper and the a video that will walk through the paper at least the rough draft of the of the paper that just outlines all my models and um and how they fit together but so that's a goal um is that experiment and i we are getting to the point if we haven't already just recently reached it where we technologically can do this if if we haven't quite reached it yet we're getting very close i have been looking a little bit uh, but um and it's not what's good about it and i think this is true of a lot of experiments that will confirm these these theories that are being worked on like donald hoffman's and mine and tom campbell's and others is they're not multi-billion dollar large hadron collider experiments they're actually you know in the hundreds of thousands tens of thousands maybe you know millions but that's actually not um not that much compared to most physics things these days um and but i have an experiment the impact that i would hope that it has is most is that i hope that it helps us navigate our lives in relationship with others and in in regard to morality and direction and goals and um and the i i'm much more interested in the social application of this of the implications of my theory even though i do believe that they have implications on all fields um but i i'm not as concerned about making you know warp drives as other you know, people in this space, I'm much more concerned about, you know, the, how this could help people find direction and, and, and realize their own meaning, not, not, not find meaning or, you know, but you, in some way meaning is generated, um, but it also exists intrinsically in us um, because of what I stated earlier. Um, but I think that I would hope my theory helps us realize our meaning and helps us generate meaning and and uh, navigate things socially, create better social systems like better companies and uh, better uh, governmental structures, uh, you know, better family uh, structures and 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 moral systems uh, than we currently have in the secular world. So that would be the main the focus of where I um, am most concerned. All right. Well, I really thank you for your time, Tyler. And uh, but I guess I'll ask you the final, final question, which is like, is there anything you want to add or that you feel is important to, to mention, uh, given everything we've talked about so far? Um, just that um, You know that everybody has meaning, and that we're that that this world, and ev that everyone in this world was created intentionally. It is logically inevitable that everyone here was created intentionally, and uh, that means that we matter, and we we have meaning to our lives, and and so does everyone else, and uh, that I think that uh, it's important to just recognize that and 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 trust that um, even before you and you maybe see it yourself and that that can be most seen when you impact others and uh, that we should try and do that in a personal and um, and committed fashion and that is the best way to for us to see that um, and I would also state that um, the 
golden rule that everybody has every great, you know, um, all of our greatest thinkers, I guess you could say over uh, the centuries have come to of treating others the way that you would want your own to be treated essentially is logically consistent idea. And it is baked into um, the implications of my work that that is correct. So I think that uh, we should all just kind of think about these things as not separate from science or logic that they are actually backed by logic. And so that's my message. Uh, other than that, I have a YouTube channel called the, um, the Theory of Everyone with Tyler Goldstein. Everyone has a zero uh, instead of an O in it. And then I have a website uh, uh, that is sentientsingularity.com. And I will be releasing a paper and a video walking through the paper uh, shortly on just outlining my, my work. But I'm very grateful to uh, you having me on as well. Uh, no, thanks for allowing me to interview you and, and giving me the time. And I think you, you also have a Discord channel, so maybe I should add that in the description as well. Um, I do have a Discord. Uh, I don't put the link anywhere. I, um, If you want the link, I do give it to anyone, though, who asks. And you can find me on Twitter at, uh, uh, I think it's Tyler M. Goldstein. And uh, I also have an Instagram, Tyler Marshall Goldstein, and I have an Instagram theory of everyone, just like my YouTube channel. If you send me a message on any of those two Instagrams uh, or on Twitter uh, asking me for the link to the Discord, I will give it to you. So it's open to anybody, but you do have to ask for it. I don't um, post the link anywhere. But you can post the link to my website and to my YouTube channel. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot, man. It's uh, It's been great. And uh... Well, I hope to see you again uh, and to discuss more stuff, get into maybe greater detail at some point. Um, cool. If not, I'll see you in the, in the chat on Thursday. Yeah, sounds good. This was great. I really appreciate it. All right, then. Take care. All right. Take care, man.